Hi. Um, I'm Abigail Durrant from Northumbria University, and I'm really pleased uh, to be here today to present work on behalf of my co-authors who are listed up there from Northumbria and Open Lab at Newcastle University and also the University of Dundee. So this work forms part of a project called Charting the Digital Lifespan. It's a now completed project. It involved partners from five UK universities and it aimed to explore what it means for individuals to live out digitally mediated lives and how the use of technologies shapes experiences of life transition. So it was interdisciplinary, combining expertise including psychology and computer science alongside design. So, in, increasingly our lives are lived online and through digital services, and people are increasingly concerned with managing their identities online. Also, more people are now active online across their lifespan, from digital natives to silver surfers. And we set out to understand from this lifespan perspective how people make sense of traces of online activity that may represent their life. We approach this by studying periods of major transition where issues of identity come to the fore. And taking a qualitative approach, our objective was to capture a rich picture about being online as it's experienced by individuals in small samples. So our paper focuses on internet use following the transition into retirement. And this design-led study was conducted at OpenLab Newcastle and involved the development of a design research artifact called OnLines, which logged and visualised key online services used by six recent retirees at home over four weeks. And what I want to do today is highlight the significance of studying transitional ex experience for HCI and in turn highlight the complexity of this experience for retirees. And I also want to contribute a case study of design, psychology and computing coming together in inquiry to understand self-reflection in technology users. So, retiring from work is understood to be one of the most significant periods of transition that a person will encounter one in which daily routines, experiences, and orientations to technology may fundamentally change, affecting subjective well-being. And our research is inspired by recent critical commentaries suggesting alternative approaches to engaging older populations. A new HCI research agenda on ageing calls for more ideographic approaches that consider the complex lives of such individuals. And retirees remain an underexplored and multi-generational population and may be considered as multifaceted individuals with substantial experience of roles and identities across their life and with valuable perspectives on technology design. Building on this, we argue that there's great potential in studying transition periods to consider changing digital behaviours and shifting values held by these users. I'm now going to describe how we designed a novel interface as a home intervention for retirees in our study to live with. And this was to prompt self-reflection and sense-making on their activities, and also to prompt dialogue with the research team. So, OnLines is a network device and was deployed with six individuals who had retired in the last five years. It tracked each participant's use of particular internet services at their home over four weeks, also displaying a real-time visualization of this use. An initial survey that we conducted with our participants showed which internet services were used most by them. Onlines was then configured to track the top five they used most. And each participant, and this is important <laughs> for the reasons that you just talked about before, um, each participant understood the logging functionality of the device and gave their informed consent to take part. We held pre- and post-deployment interviews, and then after this, a focus group was held with three of the participants meeting in person for the first time. Interview data was analysed using phenomenological methods. So, we sought to get people to pull perspective and reflect on their daily online interactions, and our design was informed by the defamiliarisation strategies previously devised by Bell and colleagues, we designed to defamiliarize by presenting our participants with an interface that revealed a novel visual trace of ordinarily invisible patterns of activity. 
And online's had two modes. In personal mode, it displayed six rows of information, one row for each service being monitored, and an extra row creating an aggregate view of overall use by the individual. So the horizontal axis that you see here depicted time of day, and the display centered its view at the current time. The device afforded touchscreen interaction for sliding this time indicator across to a desired position to encourage the active review of daily patterns. And then when online found a connection to one of the services, a line was drawn in the row matching that service on the position indicating the time of day when it was made. So the line's brightness represented the number of packets transferred to that service in the 10 minute window and the color represented the device making the connection. The secondary display mode or social mode was accessed by pressing a button on the front of the device. Social mode enabled its user to compare their aggregate use of the services with others in the sample. A physical dial allowed users to overlay several days of data to make repeated routines more evident, either in their own data or in others. So there was a strong social dimension to the visualization. And we made online standalone rather than software so that it would have a conspicuous presence in the home for ongoing walk-up interaction. And it was relatable like a radio, which we felt would be evocative for our particular research population. The interface was also to be unambiguous in functionality so that the usability would not detract from user engagement with the displays that were open to interpretation. So, our snowballed sample was recruited through a local organization supporting lifelong learning, and as such, we worked with socially engaged individuals who self-selected to participate in research that they felt would offer them new experiences and new self-knowledge. And uh, I thought it was really interesting what you said in the talk before about the trust that can be built through using that method of recruitment. So they were strangers when, um, when, when at the start of the study, and actually what happened was we found them to place what they saw as the benefits of taking part and meeting people, outweighing any potential concerns for data privacy, something that we've also carefully reflected on in ethical terms. And these are the kinds of data streams that we recorded. These are aggregates of individuals' records across the deployment. They were used to support group discussion in the exit interviews and also the later focus group. And in our later analysis, we focused on how the participants made sense of their online displays in the interviews, so their accounts at interview. All of the participants described a major shift in technology use following retirement. For each, the shift was different in nature, and for some, it was gradual. Each described how they used the internet a lot, lot more, and three described how they'd become addicted to computers, but said that this was part of feeling like they had a sense of personal freedom. So they painted a complex picture. And here's Bill, 73, who hadn't owned a computer before retiring. And he says, I learned about the internet when I retired because I knew about it, but I didn't know how to use it. And from then, it's just grown. Now I'm addicted to computers. And so <laughs> during the study, Bill described actually delivering career advice <laughs> via Skype to school children in classrooms through a local program. And this really demonstrates his shift in retirement to becoming social online. And here's a participant called Scott making sense of his social mode displays. So he says, some of them are a lot busier than me online. I'm not on as much as they are. And that's probably because I've got an active lifestyle outside, which I think is a healthy thing. It isn't too healthy to be on the internet all the time. The government seems to be doing everything online these days, which is a bit unfortunate if you're not online. So Scott set up a walking group following retirement. And what he highlighted in some detail that interview was the diversity of retiree orientations to internet use. The walking group, also for retirees, brought Scott out of depression, he said, and he described coordinating walkers' activities online and supporting others who were offline through paper-based communication. So again, we see a complex picture. And then after an initial analysis, we applied a new theoretical perspective on selfhood to help us take a lifespan-oriented view on our data. So position exchange theory, or PET, 
or if you're in Newcastle, you can see Say Pet, which is quite funny, because that's uh, <laughs> George Eastman, has phenomenological foundations and draws on the Bactinian concept of dialogism. So McCarthy and Wright and Blythe have effectively demonstrated the usefulness of Bakhtin's work to HCI for understanding user experience. And one of Bakhtin's main ideas is that dialogue with others is central to the formation, growth and expression of identity. So from a PET perspective, this is a developmental activity in the self. And this theory enables us to conceptualize self-functioning in terms of how people move and adopt um, psychological positions of identity that have a, a social and material basis. So pe people take on various social positions to function and to relate to others. And this is expressed in terms of intra and interpersonal dialogue and is mediated by things. So this enabled an analysis of how people move between identity positions as a feature of transitional experience. And we applied this framework and please see the paper for more detail on how. So the first position exchange we explore is from the employed self to the retired self. Susan, one of our participants, retired gradually, but even so described a shift in her orientation to being online for looking at things that she wants to do. And she says here, my internet use is more pleasurable since I've retired. I would use it at work and then at home would be an extension of work, whereas now I'm doing hobby things and traveling. So I'm looking at it to expand what I'm doing in retirement. Participants said that the aggregates helped them identify patterns, illuminating activities, habits, and behaviors that they found surprising or revelatory. There's more in the paper, but I'm just going to focus on one particular, particular position exchange that we, uh, that we found, and that's a sense of being a computer addict and then moving towards self-identifying as a responsible user with a balanced life. So staying with Susan, she was already a highly tech literate um, highly tech literate on retiring, but being online was now a much bigger feature of her daily life, and she found herself curiously dependent on internet access. So she says here, it surprised me that there is this definite pattern of usage. Online is telling me that I have things turned on all the time, and that I would be lost without having that access. Yes, I have my computer on every day, I switch it on in the morning, I switch it off when I go to bed at night, etc. At the focus group, the visualizations are a ticket to talk. In one instance, Rob and Iris talked about their respective late night gaming on Candy Crush. And Rob says, oh, that's when I woke up for a few hours and I thought, I'll just get back on and see if I can get to the next level. And in response, Iris talked about being stuck on a level two saying, in turn, I like things to enhance my life, not take it over. And there is that danger when it's there all the time. And then Bill replied to both of them describing how he wanted to be someone who lives a rounded life. And then Rob came back in saying, I agree, you look at everyone on the bus and they're all sitting there with phones and it's come to us now. We're all sitting like that. It does tend to take over. So what we see here is the retirees raising conflicts to actively resolve on being engaged online whilst trying to live a rounded life. And here's Iris again saying, I did make a change after using that device. When I was at work, I hadn't realized how active I was. And when I left, I put weight on because I was on the internet for a bit, and then before you know it, I'd been sitting down for three hours. So I try to now be quite structured with the day. So it's just a, an anecdote, but we, we made sense of our data in terms of position exchanges. For example, identifying expressions of computer addict to becoming a responsible user, and there are others covered in the paper. And the findings reflect individuals' enthusiasm to adopt new technologies as potential heavy users, but we also illuminate retirement as a time of continued personal growth. And with our sample, issues of pri privacy and self-disclosure just didn't feature heavily in the accounts, although the, there is some data on this in the paper. So now I'll just turn to say something about the design insights that we gained. So, the online interface did sensitize its users to the ways in which traces of online activity say something about how people live and function over time. It invited new kinds of interaction with this data and visual sense making, and it did prove useful at interview for perspective taking. However, we found issues with the design that affected its efficacy. Because we designed it to be readable in walk-up interaction, but two of the participants really struggled to read the displays without later clarification at interview. 
Bill felt the displays lacked granularity and labelling to help him meaningfully interpret the information on his own. And he said he wished to be able to discern more detail about what he was doing and for how long. And the main value that online's held during the deployment was to record data that could be visualised and reviewed at interview. However, three participants did talk about how their use of the device in the field during the study actually led them to change their online routines to enhance their sense of well-being. Or at least they said they did <laughs> to us. And there are some pragmatic insights that we can gain from this. So by seeing the live displays, the retirees seem to gear into the idea of digital living as dynamic and evolving. Their memories of life before retirement were engaged in the context of new routines that were currently being realised. And a broad and transferable insight from this research for informing the design of supportive services is that there may be value in designing interfaces to our personal data that structure dialogue with ourselves and with other people for fostering reflexivity and in turn well-being. So what we mean here is designed to support dialogical exchange for personal growth. And in the context of recent retirement, this design sensibility could help scaffold communities of interest that retirees can configure to support multiple literacies. And there's also an important consideration that because technology is always changing, social norms shifting, digital literacy shifting, retirement will affect different groups of people. And in five to 10 years time even, the nature of these groups will be fundamentally different with people holding different experiences. So the ever-changing needs of the retiree population is a really important consideration for Kai. Thank you. Hi, Robert from McGill University. I was wondering, I really like that it was like a tabletop device. And I was wondering, um, is there a re would it have the same impact if it was like a smartphone app that provided the same kind of visual display but not like a tangible object in itself? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think there's possibly, uh, you know, an opportunity to explore that um, in future work. I think the, the actual interface itself, we, we got a lot of insight from studying people's interaction with that alone. And actually the reason that it took that form is because we did this kind of initial scoping work. And we, we did have, I mean, we, with other work on the project, we have used um, phone apps and stuff. And for this, they just oriented towards something, well, very specifically like a kind of radio. They liked that idea. We presented them with a few kind of options, and that's why we arrived at that. But it would be interesting to explore other platforms. Where was it placed in their homes? Oh, they had it in different places, but in the living space, really. Hi, John Tong from Microsoft Research. So you used it among strangers, right? And did they reflect at all about whether they would prefer it to be people that they knew or even share it with their family members or any comments about that social aspect? Yeah, well, it's so interesting after your first talk and, and, and Andrew's going to be talking about privacy. And we expected them to be much more apprehensive. And I think the method of recruitment that we used really shaped, um, you know, I mean, it really you know, informed the, the kind of uh, the, the nature of the, the sample that we had in the end. So they did reflect on it. There was a, um, when they met, in, three of them met in person towards the end. And they, I think they were very keen to um, meet each other. The other thing I haven't said is we gave them the option to have pseudonyms on the device display and all of them unanimously said no, they were happy to use their own names, which is why they've been blurred out, but our ethical judgment was to anonymize and pseudonymize um, in disseminating the, re the research. So it's, it's, it, I think they wanted to meet people and they were a very particular kind of sample because we wanted to try and open up and explore this new aging agenda and think about what it means to represent people who are so socially engaged in that research population. <laughs>